There was a pastor who was in downtown Boston. He had an appointment. He was circling the block about 10 times. You know the drill, looking for a parking spot. And uh, before he knew it, he realized he was going to be late for his appointment. And so he parked in a no parking zone. He put a little note on the windshield that said, I've circled the block 10 times. I, if I don't park here, I'll miss my appointment. And then he put the little tagline, forgive us our trespasses. When he returned, he found a citation on his windshield, along with a note. I've circled this block for 10 years, and if I don't give you a ticket, I'm going to lose my job. Lead us not into temptation. <laughs> Sometimes when it comes to the Lord's Prayer and we come to that phrase, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, it kind of feels like a tagline. Just a cover our bases kind of phrase. But this morning, I want us to sit and reflect on these words in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We're journeying through the Lord's Prayer, and I've called this little mini-series in the Sermon on the Mount, the heart of prayer. Because Jesus, there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, says this then is how you should pray. He's giving us a model. He's teaching his disciples how to pray. And, and I'll admit, if I'm honest, in, in the times that I've spent in prayer, I, there's, there's times where I, I feel like I need instruction, I need direction, I need Jesus to, to take me by the hand and guide me in how to pray, what to pray. And here in the Lord's Prayer, we've journeyed through each phrase as, as Jesus is leading us to look to the greatness of God as our King and the goodness of God as our Father. And to say, hallowed be your name. I want the passion of my life to be about your glory and not mine. And, and, and as the prayer goes on to, to really envision and imagine God's kingdom that is both coming and has already come. And we embrace that reality by saying, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we rely on Jesus. We pray with an open palm saying, Lord, give us today our daily bread because we trust you with the most basic piece of our provision. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, whenever I go and visit another church and they recite the Lord's Prayer, I always kind of mumble at this part. You know the feeling? Are they going to say debts or trespasses or sins? Uh, some, some of you may have grown up in a tradition that, that prays this prayer, forgive us our trespasses. And, um, we can actually thank... Uh, William Tyndale, he, he was a reformer who translated uh, from Greek and Hebrew into uh, the English language. And he, he made the decision here to, to change it to trespass, to translate that word trespasses. But if you have your Bible, I invite you to open up to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to look at this. And actually, Matthew, as, as Jesus is teaching his disciples this prayer, he has a little commentary after the prayer ends in verse 14. And so let's take a look together at Matthew chapter 6. You see, in verse 12 we read, Forgive us our debts. I'm reading out of the NIV, the New International Version, this morning. And actually, uh, most of our translations probably translate this debts. And the reason is, there's a different word used right here in verse 12 than is used down in verse 14. In verse 14 it says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, some translations of that might be trespass against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This, I, I want to highlight here as we jump into this 
verse. We're just going to look at really one verse, Matthew chapter 6, verse 12 this morning. And as we jump into this, I want to highlight that there, there is a difference in the word here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, deaths, than the word down in verse 14 that is translated sins. And the reason is, as Jesus is teaching us to pray, he's highlighting for us um, that sin is a debt that we owe. Sin is a debt that we owe. It, when we talk about sin, sin is violating, it's in many ways trespassing a, a, across a line that we aren't meant to cross. It's violating God's standards, it's missing the mark of how God has designed life to be lived. And sin is falling short of what God requires. And for many of us, that's the reality of sin that we know. We, we know that it's crossing the line, it's doing something wrong. Uh, but as Jesus teaches us to pray, he is leading us to think this morning about forgiveness. And forgiveness requires us to understand sin as a debt. A debt that we owe. You see, when we violate God's standards, when we trespass across that line, we have taken life into our own hands. We've tried to live by our own rules. And Romans chapter 6 says the wages of sin, the debt of sin. You owe something because of that, and it is death. And so when we pray, forgive us our debts, you could really, uh, William Tyndale could, was probably uh, right when he translated this trespasses and confused this whole prayer for us, uh, but the word here is actually the word that's used of a financial debt. Now, financial debt is something that uh, has a different impact today than it would to Jesus' disciples. Uh, debt for uh, many of us is uh, just a normal uh, casualty of everyday life. Uh, it, debt is so uh, rampant in America, and in Jesus' day, debt didn't just have... Um, the connotation of a burden, it had a sentence along with it. There was something called uh, debt imprisonment. And so if you had owed a debt to somebody, they had the right to imprison you until that day that debt was paid back. And so it, this word debt, it has more of a connotation of seriousness than perhaps we read into it. And perhaps uh, that's why many uh, insert sins here, uh, because, because debt, we, we, we pray this prayer and we, we think about our student loans. Uh, but the first thing I, I want us to realize this morning that Jesus is teaching us and leading us in is that at the heart of this prayer is keeping short accounts on our sin. It's, it's confessing that we owe a debt. It's confessing that we have tried to become our own king when Jesus is king. And, and at the heart of this prayer, Jesus is teaching us to keep short accounts on our sin, to confess our sins. And I would encourage you, as we think about what is Jesus teaching us to pray here, I think he's teaching us to, to daily keep short accounts on our sin and confess that to God. Confession, I think, uh, to Psalm chapter 51, where David pours out his heart to God, and he says, create in me a clean heart. And he says, against you and you only have I sinned. And, and, he, and, and Psalm 51 is an incredible guide, and, and, and something that I would encourage you to come to often as you keep short accounts of your sin with God. 
Now, uh, keeping short accounts, that's an economical term. It's, uh, now, I am in no way, I didn't take, I didn't even take any math classes in college. I, I am, I'm not uh, the economics kind of guy, uh, but over the last three years, Mary and I have uh, developed and have just kind of gotten thrown into running a business. We have an online store where we sell some merchandise from our YouTube channel, and in the midst of that, we've had to learn the economics of running a business. And uh, one of the best tools for me was I got this, this QuickBooks account. And, uh, and, so I, and I downloaded the app. And every, every transaction that goes across all of our accounts, I either swipe left for personal or swipe right for per da uh, I'm not dating. <laughs> Uh, swipe right for business. And this has been the best tool for me. But you know what? If I forget about it, and it gets to the end of the month, and I haven't been swiping left and swiping right, it is so overwhelming. And I find that if I let that add up, if I let those transactions add up, by the end of the month, I am overwhelmed and I've lost track of where our business is at. And so what I try to do is every evening, I open the app, and I swipe left, and I swipe right, and I keep short accounts on our business. And Jesus is teaching us in this prayer to keep short accounts on your sin. Because when it adds up, you come to the end of the month, you come to an end of a season of your life, and you're like, how did I get off track? How did I get here? And you're overwhelmed by the debt, the burden that you feel on your back. And, and, and you come to, to church and you pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive and our debtors. And it feels like a tagline and it feels, uh, it feels so distant. It doesn't feel real. The forgiveness of God becomes a distant reality when we don't keep short accounts on our sin. But that's not the only thing Jesus is teaching us here. Jesus is teaching us to confess our sins, but that's the heart of, and forgive us our debts, but he is teaching us also to claim the freedom of forgiveness. To claim the freedom of forgiveness. Forgive us our debts. Embedded in those words is a deep realization that forgiveness can only come from God. If confessing our sins is realizing that we owe a debt that we cannot pay off. And claiming the freedom of forgiveness is claiming the reality that Jesus paid that debt. A passage I read moments ago, it says that you were dead in your trespasses. God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. There was a story of an elderly Christian woman who was asked uh, does the devil ever tempt you to dwell on your past sins? Well, she said, well, yes. And the person asking the question said, well, what do you do when the devil does that? And she said, well, I tell him to go east. She said, okay. Well, what if, what if he comes back from the east? She says, I tell him to go west. What if he comes back from the west? She says, I send him east again. Psalm 103, verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So when we pray the words, Forgive us our debts, we are 
claiming the freedom that there is no condemnation in the forgiveness of Jesus. That when we put our faith in Jesus and we claim him as the king of our lives, then we experience this life-changing reality of freedom in the forgiveness of Christ. That our debt that we owed was nailed to the cross and we bear it no more. Um, some of you may recognize the name Dave Ramsey. He's a personal finance guru. He's a Christian guy who he runs this, uh, this show, the Dave Ramsey Show. And many people have uh, followed his advice to get out of debt. He's got some great advice if you are looking for uh, financial uh, resources. But uh, I, I, I mention him because on his Dave Ramsey Show, occasionally I'll, I'll put on... Uh, the podcast of his show when I'm driving to and from Boston, and I, I, I just love it. It's, it's kind of uh, just amazing when someone calls into the show who was overwhelmed by financial debt, and they followed his advice, and they have a thing on the show where when you get out of debt, they have a debt-free scream. And so they, they, they tell their story, and at the end of the episode, uh, they, they, they come on there, and, and they have this thing they do. And all of them, it, it, it's, it's become a thing. And I, one of the things is I love it, because it's this moment of celebration, but also of realization. These people are already out of debt when they call in, but it's this moment of, of celebrating that reality. It goes something like this. Three, two, one. And I, I love that moment, but sometimes I, I listen to that and I realize that many people are more excited about getting out of financial debt than we are excited about getting out of a debt that demanded our life. And Colossians chapter 2 says that our legal indebtedness to God because of our sin was canceled when it was nailed to the tree, when it was nailed to the cross. And, and when we pray, forgive us our debts, we are both confessing our sin, keeping short account on our sin, but we are claiming the freedom of forgiveness. So I encourage you, in your daily and routine prayer life, have a debt-free scream. Yeah? And claim the freedom of forgiveness and say, I'm debt free by the blood of Jesus. This is the reality of the gospel. But all through this sermon, you're probably wondering, but what about that second phrase? As also we have forgiven our debtors. Jesus is teaching us in this prayer to keep short accounts on our sin, to claim the freedom of forgiveness, but he's also teaching us to connect your exercise of forgiveness with your experience of forgiveness. Jesus is teaching us to connect your exercise, your practice of forgiveness with your experience of forgiveness. And it almost sounds like Jesus is saying that God's forgiveness of us is based on our forgiveness of others. And it's important for us to realize that what Jesus is teaching us in this prayer is how to pray in the economy of God's forgiveness. Jesus is teaching us how to pray. He's not teaching us here specifically how forgiveness works. We have to take the whole counsel of God. We have to take the whole teaching of God. And we read in Ephesians chapter 2 that it is by grace we are saved. This is not by works. It's not by us forgiving others that that we are forgiven by God. But what Jesus is teaching us is that there is an inextricable connection between the two. That if you have been forgiven, you also forgive. He's teaching us that the economics of the gospel, that our debt has been canceled, 
needs to shape in us a priority for forgiveness. A priority for canceling the debts of others. If we had time, we'd go to Matthew chapter 18 where Jesus tells a parable of a, of a king who had a servant who owed a debt that he could not repay and the king cancels it. And that servant goes out and he has a little debt that someone owes him. And he shows no mercy. And, and Jesus in that same passage provocatively emphasizes that unforgiving people have not truly grasped the forgiveness of God. Now, I don't want to muddy the water, and I, I want to be clear this morning, that there are times where forgiveness is hard. We all know that reality. Life is broken, relationships are messy, and forgiveness is hard. And we are sinners. And we need to keep short accounts on our sin. And Jesus is teaching us that there is an inextricable connection between the forgiveness that we experience and the forgiveness that we exercise. But we also claim the freedom of forgiveness. And in this messy journey of life, there will be times when forgiveness is hard, when it's hard to offer the same forgiveness. And what Jesus is teaching us, he's provocatively pushing us to pray in such a way that we connect real-life scenarios, real-life relationships, real-life situations where we are struggling to forgive, to connect that to the forgiveness that you have experienced. And when you do, you will find that forgiven people forgive. Your debt has been canceled. At the cross of Jesus, we experience the forgiveness of Jesus, and it's from that place that we find the power and the freedom to let go of bitterness and resentment and the need for retaliation, and we offer the same grace that we have experienced. So I encourage you, in your prayer life, I think part of what Jesus is teaching us to do is to keep short accounts on your sin, to claim the freedom of forgiveness, but also start connecting those two things, the freedom, the gospel truth, with real life scenarios in your life. And so what part of that, what that looks like in your prayer life is, is, is you start saying, Lord, I claim the freedom that you canceled my debt. And you start thinking about relationships in your life where either you have offered forgiveness or you need to offer forgiveness. And you start to let the gospel connect to real life scenarios. And this is part of what Jesus is teaching us prayer is. Prayer isn't just this tagline. When we pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, it's not this tagline to cover our basis. It's this gospel reality that connects with our real life. And part of what Jesus is teaching us to do is to really just sit in prayer and let God con connect the dots. To let God say, Peter, I forgave your debt and you're still hanging on to that one. And you come back to the beginning of the prayer and we keep short accounts on our sin and we claim the freedom of forgiveness and we connect our exercise of forgiveness with our experience of forgiveness. Many of you will re recognize the name uh, Rachel Den Hollander. She, earlier this year, she... Uh, stood in court uh, where she gave testimony to the awful acts of sexual abuse that Larry Nasser, the USA gymnastics uh, doctor, had committed against her when she was 15. And she stood in that courtroom, and many of you may have seen the, the clip of her testimony there in the courtroom as she testified before the court of the awful acts that were committed against her. 
And there in the middle of that testimony, she turned to Larry Nasser, who had committed these acts against her. And I just want to read a portion of what she said. She said to him, You spoke of praying for forgiveness. But Larry, if you have read the Bible you carry, you know forgiveness does not come from doing good things. As if good things can erase what you have done. It comes from repentance, which requires facing and acknowledging the truth about what you have done in all its utter depravity and horror without mitigation. Without excuse, without acting as if good deeds can erase what you have seen in this courtroom today. The Bible you speak of carries a final judgment where all of God's wrath and eternal terror is poured out on men like you. Should you ever reach the point of truly facing what you have done, the guilt will be crushing. And that is what makes the gospel of Christ so sweet. Because it extends grace and hope and mercy where none should be found. And it will be there for you. I pray you experience the soul-crushing weight of guilt so you may someday experience true repentance and true forgiveness from God, which you need far more than forgiveness from me, though I extend that to you as well. I think the danger, I I wrestled whether to share this here this morning because I, I think the danger of hearing this powerful testimony of forgiveness is saying, if she can forgive somebody like that, then I can forgive. But I think that's missing the point. And it's missing the point of what she's communicating here. It's that if God has forgiven you, then you also can forgive. And that is what is so sweet about the gospel of Christ. Brothers and sisters, keep short accounts on your sin. Claim the freedom of forgiveness. And connect your exercise of forgiveness with your experience of forgiveness. Your debt has been canceled. So forgiven people become forgiving people.